In 1900, the largest and most celebrated city in America was New York City, a metropolis booming with industry, immigration, and innovation. The largest and most celebrated railroad was the Pennsylvania Railroad. One of the most powerful companies on earth, it was the first ever billion dollar corporation. And yet, by 1900, the nation's largest railroad had no direct access to the nation's largest city. All eastbound trains were stopped in Jersey City, where passengers could only complete their journey by ferry boat. Naturally, this was a problem, and the solution would become one of the greatest pieces of forgotten history. At the turn of the 20th century, America was establishing an identity. The once Wild West had been tamed. Theodore Roosevelt was president. The Ford Motor Company was founded. The Wright brothers tested the first successful airplane. Telephones appeared in homes. Ragtime and jazz grew in popularity. A new form of entertainment called motion pictures were being shown and railroads were at the center of culture and commerce. So for the president of the Pennsylvania Railroad, this was no time to let an obstacle stand in one's way. Alexander Cassatt was determined, albeit uncertain, how to get his railroad into New York. A simple fact of geography was the cause of the problem. Manhattan is an island. The Hudson River was in the way. Crossing the river by ferry was tedious, at times nauseating, and increasingly impractical with the growing population. Bridging the river proved to be impractical as well, given the amount of traffic on the river. But while in Europe, Cassatt had found an alternative solution at the French train station Gare d'Orsay. An example of Beaux-Arts architecture, the station was an inspiration for Cassatt, not just for how it looked, but for how it worked. Here was a train station with the tracks situated beneath street level, running through a series of tunnels where trains were pulled by electric locomotives. This may not have been the first time that someone thought of tunneling under the Hudson River, but a tunnel was not a bright idea if trains were to be pulled by smoke belching steam locomotives. Electric locomotives, on the other hand, would make a tunnel possible, possible to use, whether or not it was possible to build them was debatable. Underwater tunnels had been built in the 1800s, but none of them were as long or as geologically complicated as the Hudson River tunnels would be. Most people believed that a tunnel under the Hudson River could simply not be accomplished. These tunnels would fail for sure. Of course, the tunnels themselves were simply the way to the other side of the river. Once in Manhattan, trains would have to arrive at a station. For Cassatt, this new station had to represent something much greater than his company. It would reflect the prestige of New York, as well as an emerging American empire, but also a spirit of generosity and nobility. Values were different back then. It isn't that people cared less about making money, it's that they cared more about the public's esteem. In those days, that was worth the expense. The search for an architect who shared this same appreciation led to Charles McKim. McKim drew inspiration from the ancient Roman ruins of the Baths of Caracalla. He felt the same way that the Romans did about public buildings. They were not merely a place to conduct one's business. They were noble, dignified. They reflected the very people who used them. Back in New York, entire city blocks were leveled and then excavated. It was surreal, a giant eight acre hole in the ground in the middle of a major city. Then the station began to rise. An enormous steel skeleton provided the structure for a magnificent Roman facade. 
Doric columns made of granite surrounded the station, along with dozens of stoic eagles and a pair of maidens guarding each clock on each side of the station. When the station opened in 1910, New Yorkers flooded its grand arcade. They basked in the sun-splashed concourse, and stood breathless in its spectacular waiting room. 168 feet from the bottom of their shoe to the ceiling above. One of the most ambitious civil engineering projects in American history had been realized. With the tunnels complete, the Pensy had finally reached Manhattan. Traveling by train in the early 20th century was an exercise in luxury and class. Seats were spacious and comfortable. Porters were on hand in lounge cars where passengers could socialize, enjoy a drink, or watch the scenery roll by. Dining cars would serve four course meals in a handsomely decorated interior. At night, passengers could retire to their own private compartment complete with a washroom and round-the-clock service. But for passengers traveling to New York City, perhaps the most enchanting part of their journey was their arrival at Pennsylvania Station. The sounds of trains click-clacking in and out of the station the exciting echo of arrival and departure announcements, the humming of hundreds of greetings and goodbyes. People then dressed in their Sunday best. They could read the newspaper, talk to one another, or daydream for entertainment. One must have felt important when inside Penn Station. They might have even felt inspired. They certainly felt welcomed. Standing at the end of the arcade was a statue of Alexander Cassatt. He had died in office years before the station was completed, never having the chance to see it himself. Throughout the teens and into the roaring 20s, the station stood as a symbol of economic strength and prosperity. During the Great Depression in the 30s, it stood as a symbol of optimism and hope. When war came in the 1940s, it functioned as a home for many GIs. It was the last stop before they left and the first when they came home. For over a century, railroads were the standard means of transportation in the United States. But after World War II, that status was challenged. The 1950s saw the construction of the interstate highways. More and more Americans decided to sacrifice the class of train travel for the convenience of driving short distances. For long distance travel, Americans decided to sacrifice luxury for the efficiency of flying. An airplane could cross the country in a matter of hours. A train took days. Fewer and fewer people were riding the rails, and by 1960, the Pennsylvania Railroad was in debt and desperate. By now, Penn Station looked ugly after a decade of budget cuts. If the land was sold to the highest bidder and the station raised, the Pennsylvania Railroad wouldn't have to worry about its maintenance anymore. 
and more importantly, a much needed profit could be made. Despite being a public building in practice, Penn Station was, on paper, the private property of a private corporation. And like any other dying animal, the Pennsylvania Railroad made a decision out of self-preservation. They announced in 1961 that the air rights had been sold and Madison Square Garden was to be built on the site of the station, along with a plain-looking office building. The announcement didn't create an uproar. Quite the contrary. Aside from a small collection of historians and architects, nobody seemed to care. Ironically, the reason why was because no one could believe that the station would ever be lost. The very idea of demolishing Penn Station was so preposterous to so many people that this announcement was largely shrugged off. Until a rainy morning in 1963, when ordinary New Yorkers walking down 7th or 8th Avenue stood and watched as the demolition commenced. One by one, the Eagles were trucked away. One by one, the awesome Doric columns were pulled down. The grand waiting room gutted. The beautiful ceiling ripped apart and the remaining skeleton scrapped. The sun-splashed concourse was dismantled. The elegant Beaux-Arts architecture was reduced to rubble. The destruction of Penn Station sparked international outrage. Older generations felt a newfound love for traditional expression at the same time that the counterculture was championing more modern expression, and America developed a split personality. In the end, the loss of Penn Station was not only tragic, but pointless. The Pennsylvania Railroad, for all of its desperate attempts to save itself, would file for bankruptcy by the end of the decade. To this day, Penn Station operates entirely underground, beneath Penn Plaza and Madison Square Garden. The experience is less than enchanting. Passengers arriving and departing the modern Penn Station are treated to low ceilings, bad acoustics, and confusing navigation. And there is little evidence of the Roman palace that used to stand here, save for a few scattered photographs and works of art. No one would ever know what used to be. Humans, we need beauty, and train stations, it's where people come in and out. It should be beautiful. Penn Station is not beautiful. Although train travel had plummeted in the 1950s and 60s, it has steadily increased throughout the 2000s and teens. Passenger traffic on Amtrak is at an all-time high, as more and more Americans find driving less and less convenient. Pennsylvania Station is the busiest train station in the Western Hemisphere. 
But unlike other train stations in other major cities, like Chicago or Los Angeles, or cities along the Northeast Corridor, like Boston's South Station, Washington, D.C.'s Union Station, and Philadelphia's 30th Street Station, New York City's Pennsylvania Station, the busiest station in the largest city, remains squashed beneath a sports arena. It's not lost on the city of New York how great of a mistake it was losing the original station. Just two years after the demolition started, and a full year before it was complete, New York passed the Landmarks Preservation Act in 1965. Though too late to save Penn, this new legislation would help save New York's other train station, Grand Central Terminal, when a similar attempt was made to demolish it as well, in favor of an uninspiring skyscraper, of course. Grand Central was declared a landmark and saved. And that's why you've heard of it. That's why you've seen it in music videos, in movies, and in TV shows. Why is there no 210 train to Bridgeport? It only runs out of Penn Station. Oh, gross. All right, get it, come on. A true foil to the 21st century cynicism. This place really is majestic. The loss of Penn Station is arguably the catalyst for landmarks preservation in the United States. That's history. While Grand Central is the way in from the north, Penn Station is still the way in from east, west, and south of the city. Not enough that it's ugly. It also wasn't designed to handle the number of passengers it regularly does. This is a problem, and it requires a solution. Penn Station, everybody would agree, is not fit for the greatest city in the nation. Fortunately, right across the street is another architectural marvel, which is the James Farley Post Office. The idea was discussed for decades. Well, why don't we turn that into a train station and use that facility, which is powerful as a train station? They talked about it for years, they did press releases, but nothing happened. But now something is happening, and something is happening fast. Governor Andrew Cuomo has spearheaded an effort to re-establish the station right across the street in the James Farley Post Office. At first glance, it kind of looks like the old Penn Station, and that's because it was supposed to. It was designed by the same architects and built by the Pennsylvania Railroad. It's an architectural sibling of the long-lost station. It also sits right above the tracks. That made possible its recent redevelopment into the new Monaghan Train Hall, scheduled to open in 2021. It's one of those grand spaces that says New York, you know? Although more attractive and even a little reminiscent of the original station, it still doesn't improve Penn Station itself. Governor Cuomo has also approved plans to renovate the interior of the station, widening corridors, raising ceilings, and adding a new entrance at 7th Avenue. It opens up the entrance to the Long Island Railroad concourse, where it's 38 feet wide, bringing in light into the Long Island Railroad concourse and giving the concourse a sense of airiness and exposure to the light so people see the way out. All of these things are improvements, but with the station remaining underground, it's been argued that this is merely lipstick on a pig. Obviously, if Penn Station is ever to be above ground again, it would require the relocation of Madison Square Garden. There's an argument to be made that this is possible. In 2013, the New York City Council extended the garden's operating permit by only 10 years. It wouldn't be the first time that the garden relocated. This is the fourth venue to bear the name in 140 years. Come 2023, it may move again. What happens to Penn Station then? Some propose bringing the station above ground by, shall we say, recycling the stadium, repurposing the structure to bring natural sunlight back to the concourse. 
It's far from being the most ambitious proposal. There are others. They all invite natural sunlight, and they all are certainly less claustrophobic. But whether or not they are beautiful or inspiring is not obvious. Some of these designs would see Penn Station bear more of a resemblance to a shopping mall than anything else, other, more eccentric designs seem to look like what science fiction authors thought the future might look like by now, as if we were obligated to prove them right. There is one more proposal, and it's perhaps the most ambitious one of them all. Rebuild the original station. I think it's safe to say that most New Yorkers would agree that the current Penn Station is seedy, dingy, and even kind of disgusting. But replacing it with a new version of the original Penn Station seems, at least at first blush, a little crazy. No? We, we believe it would be crazy not to rebuild the original Penn Make Station. Make the argument. We think that stations like this in Washington, D.C., Union Station, 30th Street Station in Philadelphia, this type of architecture works particularly well for train stations. Is there any precedent for this kind of rebuilding, the rebuilding or the recreation of an old building that once stood but no longer? Yeah, there are, and I think that's one of the main points here is that, in fact, this has been done on a number of occasions in many places. I mean, the Give one that... The one that, that uh, comes to mind that's most striking that we always talk about is the rebuilding of Dresden. The city was completely destroyed during firebombing in World War II and now has been, you know, completely rebuilt. There's the Great Cathedral of Christ the Savior in Moscow, which was, of course, blown up under Stalin, turned into a vast outdoor swimming pool, uh, and then was rebuilt in the 1990s uh, and, and is now the cathedral for the city again. And, is, you know, you see it, you know, when portrayed on Easter and... Christmas and so on, and uh, so I think there are, you know, there are many examples like that. What's the projected cost of this project? Well, Richard's done some studies. We have looked at three, three and a half billion, four yeah. billion dollars. Now, when we say these numbers that scares people, there are billions and billions of dollars being spent on transportation projects all the time. Why this, a yeah. most strategic transportation site, is not worthy of that kind of investment is something that, okay. that we continue to question. It baffles all of us. Well, is this really possible? Is it possible to relocate Madison Square Garden? Is it possible to make a construction site out of the busiest train station on its side of the planet? Is it possible to generate enough political support and raise the funding for it? It doesn't seem possible. It's too big a project, too expensive, too ambitious. Most people would argue that it just couldn't be done. Anyone who makes that argument, whether they know it or not, they are keeping with an American tradition. You see, when the Pennsylvania Railroad tunneled under the Hudson and East Rivers and built Penn Station in the 1900s, most people argued that it couldn't be done. When it was announced that it would be demolished in the 1960s, most people argued that it just couldn't be done. Thank you.